hear for the first time this evening. And I certainly welcome you here. Brother Des Short and this school recently celebrated their 30th anniversary. Two nights before I came here, I was awakened in the middle of the night, and the Lord said, go write this down so you won't forget it. And he gave me Ezekiel chapter 1, verse 1. Don't turn, just listen. It said, as the prophet declared, in the 30th year the heavens were opened, and yet the Hebrew reads, in my 30th year the heavens were opened. It happened when Ezekiel was 30 years of age as a type prefiguring our Lord Jesus Christ who went to the Jordan at what age? 30. And with Jesus, the heavens opened at the age of 30, and they stayed open. And the Lord said, when you get to New Zealand, tell brother, tell the people that the heavens have opened over this place. Now, I cannot speak for you. I told my wife on the phone this afternoon, I said, sweetheart, it's something. I said this, the, 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 the presence of God, the manifest presence of God has settled down over this place. Not just in the meetings. If you're sensitive to the Holy Ghost, it's just settling down over this campus. I pray this area. Not because Varner's here, but because of the season that the Lord has ordained for all of you. I pray you can really hear me tonight. I'm going to say some things that's really going to be different. I'm going to teach from the book that nobody should ever read because it'll mess you up. It's a book about Jesus. And as we begin tonight, I'm going to show you how soundly he defeated Satan and that he is the seed of Abraham and the seed of David. He has the land and the throne the earth and the right to rule it. For some of you tonight, this may rock your boat. All I can do is present it. What you do with it's your business. If you're a preacher, you'll be held accountable by the Lord to preach the truth, not tradition. When I was in Chatsworth, the southern part of Durban, South Africa, preaching in front of 2,000 preachers, mostly East Indian, I watched the Holy Ghost draw a line in the sand, and I said, Brethren, after you hear this, you'll have to decide which feast you're going to preach and where you're going to walk. And the Lord did that. I don't think he's that serious tonight about it, especially where the preachers are concerned, but rather just the proclamation of truth. And so I want you to say this with me. Lord Jesus, we thank you for your word. You've saved us. You've brought us out that you might bring us in. There's never been a day like this day. There's never been a people like us. As with Esther, you have brought us into the kingdom for such a time as this. We declare with the word that Satan is completely defeated and Jesus Christ is Lord. He's not our soon-coming king. He's already king. King of kings, Lord of lords. This planet does not belong to the devil and his crowd. It belongs to Christ and his church. Mr. and Mrs. Jesus Christ. Heirs together of the grace of life. We are heirs of God. Joint heirs with Christ. We're not interested in tradition. It makes the word of no effect. You save me. Fill me with the Holy Ghost. He's my teacher. He wrote the word. It's important that I declare my heart is open, my ear is pierced. And if it comes to a choice, between truth and what I've been taught that is not true there is no choice I am willing to live and to grow and to change help me tonight I declare that I 
and the person next to me and each one here will be changed by the living word. If you believe that, praise the Lord with me. Thank you, Lord. You may be seated. I was blessed coming into the house of the Lord tonight by our elder in the Lord, Dr. Neil Patterson, who wrote this book called Created to Rule. I quote the man of God. He says, God's intention for man was to occupy a position of rulership or dominion on a throne of authority in the kingdom of God's domain here on earth. However, to place man in that position without adequate training and preparation would not be advisable. God, therefore, made known his intention to Adam and then called Adam to walk to a walk of obedience that would equip him for such a position of responsibility. Brother Dez said tonight at supper, he said, you tell them that I completely agree with everything you're going to say. <laughs> so now, would you stand up, man of God? Dr. Patterson, where are you, sir? Would you please stand? You see these two elders? Get mad at them. You may be seated. <laughs> the teacher in me wants to rehearse everything I've said since last Wednesday night. Tell your neighbor, thank God for tapes. I want to say to some people, you know, when Jesus comes again, get the tape. <laughs> but... Uh, This book that you should never read, especially chapter 7 that we'll deal with tomorrow night, you should never read that chapter, especially. Who's right it is? Sounds highfalutin. How's that for a Kiwi word? A handbook of covenantal theology. Sounds almost ominous. It's the biggest book I've ever written, over 300 pages. And it was like the pearl that's formed by an irritation, this pearl came out of an irritation, mine, a consternation, an aggravation. Upon hearing God's people, even ministers, constantly talk more about the devil than they did about Jesus and more about the old Adamic man than the new creation man. And so I began to write this book. This is not a book about eschatology. Eschatology is that branch of theology that deals with end-time prophetic events. From eschatos, which means last, furthest, or extremes. It's actually the doctrine of last things. This is not an eschatological treatise, though people use it as that. That's a shame. They miss the whole point. It's not a book about eschatology, Des. It's a book about Jesus. Because Jesus is the one whose right it is. Taken from the root text, we're not turning tonight unless I ask you to. Taken from the root text of Ezekiel, where he said, Till he come, till the one comes whose right it is, and I will give it to him. The word is mishpat, and it means a judicial right. Everybody say, here comes a judge. And Jesus, out of his own mouth, said, All executive authority has been given unto me in heaven and on earth. On the basis of that, he said, Go, great commission. Whose right it is, who he is, primarily as the seed of Abraham and as the seed of David, and what that means to us, his people. Tomorrow night, when I give you an overview of the history of dispensationalism, and carry you from 1585 to the present. And we'll talk about the three blind mice, John Darby, C.I. Schofield, and Clarence Larkin, and what they've brought to us, and where it actually came from. We will discover that the enemy had a scheme, a plan, a strategy to really thwart the purposes of God. 
We'll see, especially Friday night, when we preach a message called Nothing Can Stop the Seed. And I warn you right now, I may preach two or three hours Friday night. It's my last night here, party time. I'm going to preach. I make one request Friday night. Let me preach till I get done. Every service I've stopped before I should have, so let me preach till I get done Friday night. And Friday night I'm going to share with you that the same seed that was planted in the womb of the Virgin Mary when she was overshadowed by the Holy Ghost whew, is the same seed that was planted in you and me when we were born from above. Slap your neighbor and say, nothing can stop the seed. Ah, wow. And it's going to be my way of saying, we'll see you till later. Be my way of saying goodbye for a season. And everything we've shared will be fruitful. And he has begun a good work and you will perform it. And hallelujah, there's nothing the devil can do about it. We'll discover Friday night that his purpose is abortion. He wants to kill the seed. That's impossible because the seed is incorruptible. Therefore, plan B for him, if he can't kill it, he wants to contaminate it. And we'll talk about that. I'm deeply concerned for the nations of the earth. I am deeply concerned that many preachers, especially in the nations, have this idea somehow that if it comes out of America, it must be God. I apologize for that. I really mean that. America has not Christianized the nations. We've westernized them. And we've raped and pillaged their minds with man-centered teachings that have left the man of the spirit, the inner man, the hidden man of the heart, in a dire strait. I began to introduce this thought last night, and I'll come back on it tonight that my issue here is not eschatological. It is Christological and soteriological. Oh, I use those big words, man. Christological. What's Christology? It's the, it's the doctrine of Christ. Speaking of his person and his work, and his work flows out of his person. What is soteriology? It is the doctrine of salvation, because the Greek word for salvation is soteria, meaning a complete deliverance, spirit, soul, body. That's the issue. I'll have to say it up front, and I'm sorry I have to be plain tonight, and I, I know that you are here for the first time tonight. It may sound shocking, some of the things I'm saying. I'm not saying it to be shocking. I'm trying my best to be very gentle and very discreet, and yet you just got to proclaim truth. And when you proclaim truth, you understand something. As when you look at history, you understand that Schofield's thinking, and you may not even know who Schofield was. But the popular views of eschatology and the coming of the Lord and all of that stuff, at its very root and basis and foundation, there's one simple truth, a dichotomy between the natural Jew and the church. And Americans are absolutely obsessed with a natural land, a natural people, and a natural temple. They're obsessed with it. Maybe you are too. I don't know. But let me say from the outset, tell your neighbor, he's not here to mess with you. Tell him. <laughs> tell your neighbor, tell your neighbor, he knows you're going to believe what you want to anyway. Tell him. <laughs> so, some of you are going to be tormented tonight because you wanna, you're going to want to pick a fight. You're going to want to feud. And I'm just not in the mood. <laughs> well, I'll, I'll just draw a circle, preacher, and, and exclude you. Have at it. I'll draw a bigger circle and put you back in. You know, I'm not here to change your mind. I'm not here to tell you what to believe. You're going to believe what you want to. I just pray in Jesus' name you use the Bible when you do it. I just pray in Jesus' name you can use history to corroborate it. Because God's given you history for your mind and the Bible for your heart. Now, the whole issue here is, who is Jesus? And then by extension, who are we in him? He is the vine, we are the branch. You understand that? 
I could just quote two scriptures and we could go have tea, okay? I could quote you Matthew 1 and 1 where it says, this is the generation, singular generation of Jesus Christ. He says there he's the son of David and the son of Abraham. He's the son of the seed of Abraham. He's the son of the seed of David. Matthew 1, 1. That's who he is. Now, what's all that mean? It would take hours to tell you what that means. I've written it down. I can't even get to the Davidic covenant tonight. Can't touch it, Des. Based on the father-son relationship, promised him a family, a throne, a posterity. I can't even go there. I'd love to go there. I'd like to go to all the Davidic Psalms, Psalms 89, Psalms 132, and all of those that back that thing up. I, lo I did in the book. But every time I preach this, I get so long-winded, I never get to the Davidic covenant. Sorry. Because when you look at Jesus as the seed of Abraham and the seed of David, one more scripture, let's go have tea. 1 John four seventeen. What's it say? As he is... So are we, there's the corporate thing, where? In this world. Not when we die and go to heaven. As he is, and who is he? Talk to me. Seed of Abraham, seed of David. So if he's the seed of Abraham, who are we? Seed of Abraham, hello? If he's the seed of David, who are we? Seed of David, where? In this world. Now what's that mean? That's what I want to talk about tonight. I'm not talking about eschatology. I'm talking about identity. Who are you? Until you know who you are, you don't know what you have. And you sure don't know how to get it. The enemy is absolutely tormented. I'm a target. Why? Because I tell people who they are in Christ and what they have in Christ and how to get it. I'm dangerous. You ought to be too. The gospel's the what? Good news, not the bad news. The good news is the devil's defeated and Jesus is Lord. If you believe that, jump up and shout. Do it! Hey! Looking at me like a bird watcher and a fruit inspector. You like preaching a little bit tonight. Haven't preached yet. No, got too much ground to cover. I have 15 pages of single space notes. You think I got time to preach? That's why I'm leaving all of my notes with this, honestly. Who's right it is? Concepts. There it is. Fifteen pages. Better get to it. I began last night with a message called what? The church's relevance in the earth. I'm not going back into that. It, it introduced this thing. And we shared with you last night the concept that Jesus is the seed of Abraham. As such, he's been given the land. Not a track of land over in the Middle East. Read Romans 4. Anytime something comes to the New Testament, the Holy Ghost grabs it, it gets bigger and better. It says Abraham was heir of the world. Hello? He has the land. What's that? The earth. He has the throne, thronos, place or seat of authority. It means a, 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 a state chair, a, a seat of government that has a footstool. Too much to teach. Thronos, a place or seat of authority. That's not a chair up, up there or over there. The Thronos, the place or seat of authority, is invested totally in the name that is above every name, and that's the name of Jesus Christ. You hearing me? It's a spiritual reality. It's a new covenant reality. And Jesus Christ has been given covenantally. As the heir of all things, Hebrews 1, verse 2, he has been given the land, the earth, and the throne. Woo! The right to rule the earth. Thank you, Jesus. Then when you consider we are heirs of God, help me, and joint heirs with Christ, guess what we have? Blessed are the meek, for they shall die and go to heaven and pluck harps. No! Matthew 5 and 5. Help me preach a little bit. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Now, let me say something to you guys, you that think you're going to leave here for seven years. That's fine, but you're coming back. <laughs> Somebody says, now, you know it's not, it's not seven years. You can't find seven years. There's not seven years in the book of Revelation. There's just three and a half years and time, times and half a time, 42 months. Yeah, I know that stuff too. So we're just leaving for three and a half years. Cool. You're coming back. <laughs> he says, you're both wrong. It's a spiritual thing. Our feet aren't leaving the planet. Cool. You stayed here. So whether you're going and coming back or staying here, slap your neighbor and say, what's the big deal? <laughs> I, I, 
We want to fight over stuff. I don't understand this. You want to leave here for seven years? I don't care. You want to leave for three and a half? Fine. You want to stay? Good. He's made us kings and priests. Is that the Bible? Romans 5, or pardon me, Revelation 5, 10, and we shall reign on the earth. We got our theology out of the song book, not the book. Man was created in the image and likeness of God. I covered all that last night. Covered all that last night. God owns the earth. Psalms 24, 1, man's a steward. Covered that last night. The conclusion from last night. Should have been here last night. <laughs> we must have a paradigm shift. What in the world is a paradigm shift? Is that when you, you know, what is that? A paradigm is a mindset, a mentality, a way of thinking. A paradigm shifts when you renew your mind, change your way of thinking. Your problem is not the devil. It's what you think about the devil. Come on. We must have a paradigm shift away from traditional dispensationalism, and I realize that there's an aspect of dispensationalism by the use of the word, as Dr. Patterson showed me today, and I knew that, that, that it deals with certain, you know, times and seasons. But I'm using dispensationalism because that's the word everybody can relate to. It's also known as futurism because it takes a lot of these things. It takes Daniel's prophecy of 70 weeks, which we will exegete tomorrow night. It takes Matthew 24, it takes Revelation 4 to 19, and it puts it all out here. My message last night is we need to reevaluate, we need to reconsider the relevance of the church and the earth, our purpose, why we are here. I showed you last night we are salt, light, and witness, and the earth's only hope in Christ. The enemy's plan is to evacuate us from the earth and from history. Nothing can stop the sea. I'm going moving right along. That's Friday night stuff. That's Friday night stuff. Now, I told you I was going to begin tonight by giving you three Pentecostal traditions about the devil. Why do I want to do that? <sighs> because you can't get into this without understanding how defeated he is and that Jesus is Lord. Pure Schofieldian dispensationalism is very pessimistic. In my mind, it's immoral. In my mind, it's a doctrine of demons, but I won't say that because if I said it was a doctrine of demons, surely somebody would get upset, so I will not say it's a doctrine of demons. <laughs> but it's irresponsible. It's unclean. It's what Paul called another gospel. Really. Because in its purest sense, when Schofield wrote his Bible in 1909, now they fudged in 1917 when they revised it. But in the original Schofield Bible, he said animals were going to be sacrificed. And I don't care if it's in a memorial sense or whatever sense, when I was in a Pentecostal Bible school 30 years ago, I had to write a paper for a class called Dispensational Truth that, that told that animals were going to be sacrificed again in a rebuilt temple. I still have that paper. I don't know why I've kept it. But anybody who's read Hebrews and has got a lick of a brain knows that Jesus Christ is the once and for all sacrifice. There will not be another. Help me, somebody. So when I say, Brother Dez, I'm sneaky. I am really sneaky. When I say pure, classical Schofieldian dispensationalism, I speak of the 1909 version. Now, they've watered it down since, and they've backed off since, and a lot of them have switched gears since. But there it is. And Schofield was a student of Darby for 40 years. He, he, he plagiarized Darby. He plagiarized the nine dispensations from J.R. Gray's in 1893. But I'll, I'll talk more about Schofield tomorrow. Anyway, I'll show you where we got it. The point is made that you've got to understand three things about the devil that most Pentecostals believe and have never checked it out. Here's the first one. You ready? Tell your neighbor. Say, the devil is not God's adversary. Now, I know that's a semantic, and I know I could be cute in saying it that way, but this is what I mean by that, okay? Don't, don't try to analyze me. Just enjoy the word. I'm trying to help you, okay? Turn to your neighbor and say, leave him alone. Let him preach. Thank you. 
Somebody next to you gets mean, just slap them good for me. <laughs> Do it in the name of the Lord. You know why the devil's not God's adversary? Because God has a name now. Tell me his name. Jesus. Is that okay with you? Can I, can I get a witness that Jesus is God Almighty in the flesh? Can, can, that's why Copeland and all those guys preaching that thing that he went to hell to be spiritually reborn is so dangerous. It broaches his deity. Walk softly, brethren. You stole that from E.W. Kenyon. He didn't believe in tongues. Watch it, boys. Watch it, boys. Watch it, boys. When he said it's finished, honey, it was finished. He didn't go to hell to do anything but to announce the victory. He said, give me the keys, please. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Jesus is God. Oh, I want to say that. You know, people love to talk about God. God, God, God. You walk in the room, we'll talk about God. But boy, when you say Jesus, boy, it's like putting a hot knife through butter. You know what I mean? It just gets right down to it. Oh, say that name with me. Jesus! <laughs> he took upon himself the form of a servant, made in the likeness of men. Hallelujah. Became obedient to the death of the cross. Wherefore, God has highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee, including yours, would bow, and every tongue, including yours, would confess that he is Lord. Jesus! That name will strike terror into the heart of demons, especially religious ones. Jesus is God. Now tell me what enemies he has. They're all under his feet. And as we learned from Ruth this morning, even death. Mm -hmm. He's not God's adversary. The devil's not God's adversary. Peter said he's yours. First Peter 5, 8, but your adversary, the devil, goes about as a roaring lion. Doesn't say he is one. He's Clarence the cross-eyed lion with no teeth. <laughs> seeking whom he may devour or swallow up. And baby, he's got to find you first. Where are you? I'm quoting your Bible. You have died and your life is hid with Christ in God. He's got to find you first. Hmm. In America, folks are ignorant. I know you Kiwis are smart, but in America they're ignorant. They get up and testify. Aunt Susie on Sunday night, well, devil tried to kill me today, hallelujah. <laughs> It happens. I tried to get to church tonight, but I had a flat tire. The devil gave me a flat tire. Thank you, Jesus. <laughs> Wait a minute, Aunt Susie. Every flat tire I ever saw had a hole in it. <laughs> you can laugh. It's not funny. In America, Pentecostal, tongue-talking people, talk more about the devil than they do about our Lord. It's tragic. No wonder Hosea said in 6 and 4, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. That's why I wrote the book, Des, to show them that the devil's defeated and Jesus is Lord. That's the first two-thirds of that book, the eschatological application. That's just gravy, man. The book's about Jesus. And so let me correct myself read this book eat it guts feathers and all and when you read it go hog wild and slop crazy it's about Jesus you want to know who Jesus is and how soundly he defeated the evil one read this book I have eight absolutes in here on how soundly he defeated him. I can't give you all those tonight. He spoiled principalities and powers, Colossians 2.15. He slew the giant, David and Goliath. He bound the strong man because he was the stronger man. Isaiah 27.1, he was the dragon slayer. He slew the dragon in the midst of the sea, teeming masses of unregenerate humanity. On it goes, all the way down to he abolished death and then divided the spoils. Eight absolutes. They're not going to change. The devil's defeated. Jesus is Lord. Satan is not God's adversary. He's yours. 
second Pentecostal tradition. Satan has never had jurisdiction of this planet. Never. Kenyon and Copeland and all the boys say that Adam committed high treason and turned it all over to the devil. Cap says there's a lease on this thing. Read it again, boys. Mm -mm. There's a difference, number one, between the earth and the world, which is the transient cosmos. In the temptation of Matthew 4, the devil showed Jesus all the kingdoms of the cosmos, a transient thing. Cosmos, cosmetic, melts in the fire, won't last. There's a difference between the world and the earth. In 2 Peter 3, there's three worlds. The world that then was, Noah's world. God destroyed that world, but the earth remained. There's a preserve, our world reserved under fire. That's the word. There's a third world wherein dwells righteousness. That's the kingdom. Too much to teach there. Don't worry about that. Take that. Put that there. All I'm saying is there's a difference between the earth and the world. Satan is the god and prince of this world system. Come on. John 12, 31, 2 Corinthians 4, 4. All right? He's the god and prince of this world system, just like Pharaoh was the god and prince of Egypt. But the earth, help me someone, is, is the Lord's. Psalms 24, 1. You understand that? Satan has never had authority here. And when Adam did commit high treason... God said, I'll take the keys, I'll take the, I'll take the title deed, I'll take the little book, however you want to talk that, and I'm going to hold it on until he comes, who's right it is, and I'll give it to him. Galatians says, until the seed should come, to whom the promise was made. God retained that. The devil's never had it. So trash that song, we're going in the enemy's camp, take back what he stole from me, idiots you call me an idiot no I call the song idiotic well that bounced off the walls <laughs> why sing stuff that isn't true well I like the tempo well go to the nightclub <laughs> go to the pub keep that mess out of church 1 Samuel 30 type of Jesus. He recovered it all. David recovered it all. If the devil did steal anything, Jesus recovered it. So what are you going to the enemy's camp and doing? We open our church services and bind every demon in the place. Nonsense. You just attract demons to your church service. You give them attention. They love it. How can you bind something that's already bound? Slap your neighbor and say, he's making me think already. Now, when I, when I step out of the book, you tell me. When I get out of that book there, you tell me. What's the first Pentecostal tradition? Satan is not God's adversary. He's yours. What's the second one? He's never had authority. He's a usurper. He's an intruder. Third tradition. He's not the thief of John 10 and 10 anymore. Now, if you're unsaved, if you don't know Christ, he's a thief to you. He'll chew you up, spit you out, and destroy you. And he's had centuries of practice. He's done in a better man than you time and again. Y'all listening? But John 10 was written before the cross. If you want to know who the thieves are, because it's plural in John 10, 8, Jesus said, all that ever came before me or in front of me, pro, made superior to me are thieves and robbers. If you want to know who the real thieves are, read that book. It was a jar if I told you. Nonetheless, he's not the thief of John 10 and 10 anymore. You know why Satan is not the thief anymore? He was crucified. This is meat. There were three men crucified. The man on the middle cross was Jesus Christ of Nazareth, God Almighty in the flesh. Can I get a witness? The thief on the right who repented and said, remember me, put me back together, reconstitute me, was Adam in the flesh, restored to paradise and the kingdom. Who was the other thief? Wait a minute. In the temptation, Luke 4, verse 3, verse 9, the same one who said, if you be the Son of God. 
And then in Luke 4, 13, departed for a season to return that awful day to be dealt with. In Luke 23, 39 said, if you be the Christ, get us off of here. It was Satan in the flesh. And in the one final, once and for all, all-inclusive, powerful power of God, the proclamation of the cross is the power of God. Because in that one grand operation, it is finished. He dealt a final death blow to the first man, Adam. And for this purpose, the Son of God was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil. He did it at the cross. Oh, come on. Colossians 2 and 15, he embarrassed and spoiled principalities and powers in that cross. Satan was crucified, dealt with, demoralized. The word destroyed is luo in 1 John 3, 8. Humpty Dumpty sat on a wall. Humpty Dumpty had a great fall. All the king's horses and all the king's men couldn't put the poor old devil back together again. Hallelujah! The word means to dismantle piece by piece. He tore him up. Well, somebody ought to be shouting, Hallelujah! Come on, you Kiwis, wake up! You are not down under, baby. You are up over. You are the head and not the tail. Renew your mind. Hallelujah. Your king, your Lord, your Savior, your husband is Jesus Christ, King of kings, Lord of lords. If you believe it, stand up and shout. Yay! Bunch of lazy people here on the front row don't believe it. I said, stand up and shout. Look at them. They still won't do it dangerous to sit on the front row. You get spit on and everything else when I preach. Now, am I telling you the truth or what? I just spit on you. Is this the good news? All I'm preaching, folks, is the devil's defeated and Jesus is Lord. Anybody believe it? Gee whiz. He's crucified. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 2.8 that the princes of this world would have known. Wouldn't have crucified him. Matthew 27. Those Pharisees who were full of demons. How do you know they were full of demons? They called my Lord a deceiver. Anybody that calls Jesus a deceiver is full of the devil. They said if that deceiver comes up. Matthew 27, 62 to 66. If that man comes up and rises from the dead like he said. He said, boys, you better put a rock, a big one over that thing. Because if he comes up, like he said, listen to how the devil's talking through these Pharisees. He said, the last error shall be worse than the first. Listen to the admission of Satan. I made a mistake. If he comes up, like he said, the last error, his resurrection, will do me more damage than his crucifixion. And Romans 1 declares in verses 3 and 4 that he was declared to be the Son of God with power by that resurrection. My God, there's too much to tell you. We don't preach the gospel. We tell graveyard stories and we titillate and we get a clever little ditty off the tree of the knowledge of good and evil and call that preaching. Very few preachers in America. Very few preachers in America. Paul said, preach the word. I love you. I'm not messing with you now. I'm stirring myself up. He's not the thief anymore. If you're lost, if you don't know Christ, he's a thief to you. He'll eat you up. He's a killer. He's a destroyer. But to those of us that know Christ, come on, somebody. He's not the thief anymore. That's so airtight you can't touch it. I'm not trying to be cute. I'm not, this is not apologetics, Bible school students. I'm not trying to build a case. I'm just telling you the truth. What you do with it's up to you. Now let's see what my notes say. Because, you know, I can't preach without them. Hmm. Hmm. Yes, not. Hmm. Lord God, this might be a two-taper tonight. We on the front side or back side, son? Where are we at? Five minutes on the front side. 
You mean I've been up here 40 minutes already? Good grief. I'm on page four. <laughs> and it didn't even preach pages two and three. No. Now, because I've given these notes, and they could be copied, I've got all these scriptures written out. I could read them. If I have covered all these scriptures, there'd be a couple of hundred scriptures I'd give you. I can't do that in an hour. I wouldn't try. It'd drive us all crazy. So let me just take great chunks of truth and proclaim it. Is that all right? And if you want the notes, see this. Fair enough? Good. Jesus Christ is the seed of Abraham. I have wanted so much to teach on the seven separations of Abraham. I can't do it tonight. I could, but you'd be here four hours. And there's some fanatics saying, it's okay. And some people in the back say, oh, my God. <laughs> Jesus is the seed of Abraham. The Bible says in Galatians 3.16, just listen. In Galatians 3.16, it says, Now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. He said, he didn't make this promise unto many seeds, but to one seed, even to thy seed, which is Christ. J. Dwight Pentecost in his doctoral dissertation, it's a book that thick, it's written years ago called Things to Come, said that the church is a seed of Abraham. No, we're the seed of Abraham. There's only one the seed of Abraham. Here's where men miss it. Listen to me. Here's where men miss it. Turn to your neighbor and say, the seed is Christ. Say, the seed has always been spiritual. That's why Anglo-Saxonism, British Israelism that came out that says the white man is Israel is wrong because it makes the seed a natural thing. Then the black man that came out with the Cushite message and says it's the day of the black man, which is a flip side to that. It's wrong because it makes the seed a natural thing. Christ is neither male nor female. Help me, come on. He's neither Jew nor Greek. He's neither black or white. He transcends all that. You understand? He transcends the issues of men. There was a woman with an issue of blood. Blood, a dom, red, ruddy. And it's a picture of the church bleeding to death because of issues. She pressed through the crowd, touched him who is the issue. For what? Keep your heart with all diligence for out of it, out of your hearts, spring the issues of life. Jesus came from the bosom of the Father. He's the issue. When, when she pressed through the crowd and touched him who is the issue, all the other issues were healed. Oh, come on, somebody. It's a Jesus thing, people. It's a Jesus thing, people. Come on. He is the seed of Abraham. And Galatians 3.28 makes it so plain that in Christ there is neither Jew nor Greek, bond nor free, male nor female. And then the scripture that changed my life in 1969, Galatians 3.29 says, if you be Christ or if you belong to Christ, then are you Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise? Go right into chapter 4. Now I, now, I say that the heir, as long as he's a child, differeth nothing from a servant, though he be lord of all or owner of everything. But he's under tutors and governors until the time appointed of the father. The whole issue, this is strong. Listen if you can. Eat what you can. The whole issue of the Galatian letter is the maturation of the seed. The whole issue of Galatians is the maturing of the seed. And in that letter, two things can kill the seed. Law and lust, legalism and license. The Judaizers and the Antinomians. Namas' law, anti-law, lawless. For the Judaizers, Paul said, you didn't get the Holy Ghost by the works of the flesh. Come on, boys. And, and for the Antinomians, as any fool knows what sin is. The works of the flesh are obvious in one of his famous lists. And so legalism will kill you. License will kill you quicker. It will abort the seed. The issue is, watch me, the maturity of the seed. Satan hates the seed. He wants to keep the church in diapers. And give them a doctrine that's easy. That says if, all, if you're just born again, you're out of here on the first load. People like that. It's comfortable. It's irresponsible. You don't have to be baptized in water. You don't have to be filled with the Holy Ghost. You don't have to witness your faith. You don't have to be in a local church under season ministry. You don't have to tithe. Just be born again and you're out of here. You wish. Number one, the flight's been canceled due to inclement weather. <laughs> so unpack your bags, my darling. 
That sound means we're going to side two. Questions. Who's the real Jew? Romans 2, 28 and 29. A man is not a Jew if he's only one outwardly, nor is circumcision merely outward and physical. No, a man is a Jew if he's one inwardly, and circumcision is circumcision of the heart by the Spirit, not by the written code. Such a man's praise is not from men, but from God. Romans 2, 28 and 29, NIV. King James says he's not a Jew, which is one outwardly, but one inwardly. He's had a heart circumcision. Clear back in the Pentateuch, in the Torah, God talked about the foreskin of the heart. It's a heart circumcision. I didn't write this. Paul wrote this. Look at your neighbor and say, the Jew is you. And for our friends who are Messianic Jews, you're no different than a charismatic Baptist. Where's the adjective? Where's the noun? That's rough. A Messianic Jew. Where's the adjective? Where's the noun? What's more important? The modifier or the object of the modifier? You've got to know English to know that stuff. A Messianic Jew is more important to be a Jew than it is to be one connected to Messiah. That's rough as nails. So is a charismatic Baptist. Why don't you just say you're a Christian and God will forgive you for all the other stuff. I can't chase rabbits. I can't chase rabbits. I want to chase rabbits. Because if you see what some of you guys believe, we need to chase rabbits. Romans 9, 6 through 8, he said, It's not as though God's word had failed, for not all who are descended from Israel are Israel. The King James says, Romans 9, 6, for they're not all Israel who are Israel. The Amplified says, just because they're the natural descendants of Jacob, they don't belong to the true Israel of God. He goes on to say in verse 8, he says, In other words, it is not the natural children who are God's children, but it's the children of the promise who are regarded as Abraham's offspring. That's rough. The natural Jew are not, they're, they're not the children of God. Let that sink in and let it bounce. Let it crawl. It's got hair on it. Let it crawl. The natural Jew are not God's chosen people. No. You give me chapter and verse if you're adamant about your posture. <coughs> The church is the chosen generation. Help me. The church is the holy nation. The church is the royal priesthood. The church is the Israel of God, Galatians 6.16. The church. Now, come on, you theologians. This is not replacement theology. Don't get up on that stuff with me. It's not replacement theology. It's placement theology. I am not anti-Semitic. I am pro-Jesus. Let me preach. There's an inordinate obsession in America with a natural Jew, a natural land, and a natural temple. It's because Schofield did it that way. And what you better understand is the thinking of the devil behind inventing all that mess because if they are God's chosen people, if the church, I've just got to get away from my notes a minute, if the church is not, then the church is just the parentheses. Nonsense. It was the law that was parenthetical and was added because of the transgression, and did not disannul the Abrahamic covenant that we're part of. Read Galatians 3, the whole chapter. You understand me? If you believe this stuff that Schofield preaches, and if you continue to believe the stuff that some of you preach, you're still preaching it, and we end up being a spiritual stepchild, a second-class citizen, and Kiwis love it, because you already think that way about yourself. I might get killed before the night's out, and this crowd might get mean, but I will tell you the truth. And you know why you like to think that way about yourself? No responsibilities. Just a fierce independence. You can't come in here and talk to us this way and argue with the one who sent me. I'm not afraid of your faces. I love you. I love you enough to tell you the truth. You're not down under. You're up over. And the revival that comes to this beautiful and great nation will not come from America. It won't, it won't come through some smart aleck, some hired gun. No. It'll come up and out of the hearts of overcomers in this nation. You ought to stand up and thank God for that. <laughs> Sit down. That was a pitiful stand up and thank God. So just, just sit down. Just sit down. Whew. Brother Varner, I need some more proof. Well, that's what I've got notes for. 
John the Baptist came. He was a prophet. They didn't like him. He said in Matthew 3, 7 through 10, he said this. He said, the axe is laid to the root of the trees. Des, I've got scriptures out of 1 Kings, Psalms, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Hosea, Malachi of what the prophet said about God said, if you continue, Old Testament Israel, to continue in your idolatry, God's going to put the axe. He's going to put the thing to the root. They did and he did. And he laid the axe to the root of the tree. Watch me now. Watch me now. Watch me now. And he cut that tree down. And he planted a brand new vine in the earth, John 15. And Jesus Christ is the true and genuine vine, and the branches of that planting are men and women from all nations. Come on, somebody. Yes. And now that Christ has come, there's neither Jew nor Greek. I'm going to say the most powerful thing I'm going to say all night is the word of wisdom. It will end the argument that's in the room. You ready? I have no advantage over the natural Jew, and he has none over me. We both must be born again by faith. That cleared the air. That's the word of wisdom. Quit arguing. I have no advantage over my Jewish brother. He has none over me. We both must be saved by grace through faith in the blood of the Lamb. Give God a hand clap. Come on. That's really wisdom. That's wisdom. And when I show you Daniel 9 tomorrow night, the reason the devil butchered that scripture, the main reason, because if it's precisely interpreted, which it will be, and historically sound as it will be, it proves that Messiah came to this planet prior to 70 A.D. You think the devil wants the Jewish people of the earth to know that? See, Paul said we're not ignorant of his devices, noema, his thoughts, his schemes, his strategies. Get the thinking behind this stuff. As I told the Bible school students, use your head for something besides a hat rack. Think this through. The purpose of the evil one. If I don't get through these notes, I don't really care. I'm leaving them with this. You've got to hear my heart because I love you people. The greatest need throughout your great nation, whoever you are and wherever you're from and whatever you believe, your greatest need is to discover all that you are in Christ. The devil's ploy is to keep you from ever knowing that. 2 Corinthians 4, to blind your mind lest you believe it. And he wants to keep you into a state of immaturity. The heir, now I say the heir as long as he's a child, differ nothing from a servant though he be Lord of all. The issue's maturity, the tutors and governors of the five-fold ministry to bring you to maturity. When Jesus left here, he didn't leave bishops in the earth. God, he didn't leave popes. He didn't leave cardinals. He didn't even leave elders and deacons. He left apostles and prophets and evangelists and pastors and teachers, and that and that alone will mature the church. Hallelujah. I got a hallelujah. How about this side? Now, obviously, tell your neighbor, this is not a sermonette for Christianettes. Tell them. <laughs> You've got to understand what I'm saying and why I'm saying it. As long as we keep hold of traditional prophecy teaching, it says that another people, another time, gets all that stuff. Mm -mm. The devil doesn't care what you people believe as long as it's in the future. And he only has one weapon, and it's suggestion. He's the serpent who whispers in your ear. And he'll tell you these three things. This is the only way he can get you. His only weapon is suggestion. That's it. I'm stripping him bone naked tonight. I'm stripping him. That's why I'm a target. That's why you better pray for guys like me. I mean that. Because right now I'm under assault. So is my church. One of my deacons just had a baby boy today by a cesarean section. Had to helicopter him up to another hospital. Trouble breathing. He'll be fine. They put him on oxygen, 100% oxygen. Now he's down to 40%. He'll be cool. 
but it's just part of what we're going through as a church because God's thrusting me out now into the nations. It's one thing to tell this stuff to America, but boy, when you take it to the nations, principalities get real upset. Okay? I endured some tremendous warfare before I came here. Not just my church, but churches are fasting and praying for you these 10 days. It's not my preaching or teaching. Uh -uh. It's the prayers that went before me. You hear me? This is serious stuff. New Zealand will never change till you people change it. And the devil comes and hears his ploy. This is what he'll say. Number one, you cannot have the promise. And dispensationalism makes that easy. It gives it to the Jew. Gives it to the future. So you hit him in the head and say, you know, I can't so have the promise. He said, well, you can't have it now. Oh, yes, I can. He said, well, it won't last. And that's all he's got. I'm telling you, that's all he's got. That's all Humpty Dumpty's left with, man. You can't have the promise. If you can, you can't have it now. And if you can have it now, it won't last. In your face, devil. If we weren't in mixed company, I'd say to hell with the devil. But if I said that, then you'd go out here saying the man was cussing and fuming and throwing chairs. So I won't say to hell with the devil. But I could say to hell with the devil because hell is prepared for the devil. Oh, to hell with the devil! That'll look good on tape. Come on, you preachers. Don't you ever feel like that? We can have the promise. My God, we are the promise. We can have it now. The promises of God are yes and amen. And it will last. He's the alpha, the omega, the beginning and the ending. His promises are immutable. There won't be another priesthood. This is it. Still just preaching about Jesus. Let's see where I am on my notes. These are great notes. Jesus got perturbed one afternoon, looked the Pharisees down the gun barrel and said in Matthew 21, 42, and 43, he said, the kingdom is taken from you and given to a nation that will bring forth the fruit of it. 1 Peter 2, 9 says that nation is the holy nation, is the church. Matthew 3, 7 through 12 says bring forth fruit and meat for repentance. That's old English. It means produce fruit that proves you've repented. The New Testament criterion for being a Christian is not whether you're a Jew or a Greek or a Russian or white or black or male or female or pretty or ugly. It is, are you bearing fruit? Fruit is his nature, his character. Are you like Christ? That is what a Christian is. You hear me? Jesus said, it's taken from you boys and given to a nation that produces the fruit of it. Peter said, the church, those who deem him precious, read First Peter, read, uh, first Peter 2, first 10 verses. He says in verse 10, which in time past were not a people, but are now the people of God. Who's a true circumcision? Philippians 3, 3, New American Standard. For we are the true circumcision who worship in the Spirit of God and glory or boast in Christ Jesus and put no confidence in the flesh. Read that from an Amplified Bible. It'll really help you. Well, preacher of honor, what about, what about Jerusalem? Let's talk about Jerusalem. Paul talked about Jerusalem. Whew, man, I haven't got to anything I want to say tonight. I'm going to say this and get on with it. Galatians 4, 21 to 31 is an allegory. Old Testament, New Testament, earthly Jerusalem, heavenly Jerusalem. One genders to bondage, the other's a mother of us all. I'm not going into all that. That's too much to tell you. We're not marching to Zion. Zion's marching. We're not looking for a city. We are the city. Hebrews 12, 22 and 24 says what? Now you are come <clears throat> to Mount Zion. He said Zion is the heavenly Jerusalem. He said it's the church of the firstborn. I'm not here to debate. I'm tired even going through this. I feel like I'm preaching to the choir. I'd go in and talk about an Israelite indeed, 
The term Hebrew and Jew are man-given terms. Descendants of Eber, descendants of Judah. The term Israel is a God-given term. Genesis 32 it describes a man who's met God face to face, had his name or nature changed. I'd like to exegete that. Too much. Everybody say, thank God. Des has the notes. Eschatological concepts. I'm finally to where I want to get to. We're no longer Gentiles. Ethmos talks about pagan. Don't call me a Gentile. I already covered that in another message. I'm not going to touch that. I'll just read the NIV of Ephesians 2, 11, and 12. Therefore remember that formerly you who were Gentiles by birth and called uncircumcised by those who call themselves the circumcision, he says, remember that at that time when you were lost, you were separate from Christ, excluding from citizenship in Israel, foreigners to the covenants of the promise, without hope, without God in the world. Don't insult Calvary's grace by calling me a Gentile. I preached that on another message. Get all the tapes. Let's delve into the eschatology just a tad. With regards to the coming of the Lord, the byword, the key concept, is not, with regards to the timing of it, is not any minute or eminence. The key word is until. Jesus himself said, and we'll talk tomorrow night with the history about the date setters, but everybody's had them. Jack Van Empey's slick, man. Used to be the date setters, you know. Uh, before I tell you about them, I just want to say this. That that prophecy clock, it takes a licking and keeps on ticking. All right. You get that later. That's an American phrase. Timex watches. It takes a licking and keeps on ticking. Van Empey, slick, man. They did the thing from 48 to 88, you know, the generation. That didn't pan. So now he's taken it from 67 to 2007, bought him seven more years so he can pan, panhandle his wares. He's slick. And you think just because he can quote the Bible, a parrot can quote the Bible. You knocking Jack Van Empey? No. But as he just spews scripture after scripture, watch how many times he goes back to Daniel 9 as a basis. See, now you're mad because I picked out somebody and named him. Get over it. Well, I don't believe what you're preaching tonight. You've been wrong before. That's mean, isn't it? But just one or two zingers in the room, there's about three or four people in here that I'd like to talk to you personally after service. I might come up and do that because I know who you are. In this crowd, mm -hmm. how can you tell? You can tell. You can discern. I'm not threatening. I'm not being mean. All I would ask is you, you do your homework. You study history and you study the Bible. Then let's have, a, let's have a meaningful conversation. Okay? Now let's come back up here. The air is cleaner. It's not any minute. It's until. The most wonderful scripture in the Bible. The most unique one. He said in Psalms 110. The Lord said unto my Lord, sit thou at my right hand. What? Until. Until I make your enemies your footstool. <clears throat> That's found in the Synoptic Gospels. Matthew, Mark, Luke. It's found in the book of Acts. It's found in 1 Corinthians 15. It's found twice in Hebrews. And the last in Hebrews 10, 12, and 13, it says, This man, after he'd offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down at the right hand of the majesty in heavens. From henceforth, <clears throat> meaning from the time he sat down till now, expecting till his enemies be made his footstool. It's a time word. Until is a time word. Jesus said, No man knows the day nor the hour. So get off that stuff. It's a time word. Until. Until what? Until he received the early and the latter rain. Until we all come into the unity of the faith. Come on. Until Acts 3, 19, 20. You know that. You know all the scriptures, don't you? Okay, if you don't ask Des. <laughs> Kept during the hour of trial. I preached that over at uh, Pastor Disroon's church. Get the tape. Ask Brother Disroon's. He knows all about that. Okay? Uh, if I get into that, you, you'll shoot me, but it's okay. I've got all the references. Je Des got my notes. Where Jesus constantly, I put down every place where Jesus mentioned this generation. And then he said it wouldn't pass till all this stuff be fulfilled. I promise he meant that generation. You see, what many people call the last days was actually the last days of Judaism. Hebrews 1.1, 1, 1, hath in these last days spoken unto us through his son. That's 2,000 years ago. Now, don't mistake me. 
okay? Matthew 24, Mark 13, Luke 21. They're mostly, by and large, fulfilled historically. We'll see that tomorrow night. But there are prophetic overtones. Because prophecy is like that. There's a present fulfillment and prophetic overtone. So do you believe those scriptures are historically fulfilled, or do they have prophetic overtones? Yes. I was in Dr. Neil Patterson's office today, and he let me know the issue just simply was this, a misinterpretation of Matthew 24, 27, pardon me, 37 to 41, and he's absolutely right, where Jesus said it's like Noah's day, one shall be taken, the other left. Read, read who was taken, who was left. Come on. The heathen, the wicked were taken in judgment. The righteous were left to inherit the earth. Luke's parallel passage said the flood came and destroyed them all. So you want to have some fun? Go into a church on Sunday night where they really believe this stuff and stand up and testify. Say, Hallelujah! Thank God I'm so glad to be here. <laughs> we need a little levity right now because some of these people look real serious. <laughs> And I just want you to know I'm born again and I'm filled with the Holy Ghost. And I'll tell you what, hallelujah, I want to be left. And sit down and watch what happens. <laughs> They'll come and take you away, man. <laughs> I'd rather believe the true prophet than anyone else. And Jesus, the true prophet, said the wicked were taken and the righteous were left. That's what it reads in 1 Thessalonians 4. I want to get over there and exegete that verse by verse. Probably just leave the notes with you, Des. This crowd looks too mean to do that. <laughs> we which are alive and remain. Paralipo means to be left over. Left over after what, baby? After everything that can be shaken will be shaken. What about Armageddon? Well, what about it? There's no such place on the planet. You've got beautiful mountains, especially in the southern island. I've been looking at a picture book. I want to get down there for a month. I don't have time to do it. Next time, all right. Oh, I'd love that. You've got beautiful mountains, wonderful land. But there's no such thing as Armageddon. I beg your pardon. Well, it's Harmageddo. Har means mountain. There is no mountain of Megiddo in the earth. Don't look at me funny. And because there is not, there's a valley of Megiddo. There's no mountain. So it can't be something natural. That battle has to be spiritual. And in the book, I showed you historically and presently what that real battle of Armageddon's like. Don't read this book. It'll mess you up. I went to the two Old Testament references where the valley of Megiddo came into play did all that. Can't do that here. Let's just talk. I want you to know you don't really realize who you're talking to. I have been to the Holy Land. I went there in 82 with 50 Pentecostal preachers. Ain't that a hoot? <laughs> and we were up at the Valley of Megiddo and looking out over the plain of Esdralon. And there to my left, oh, way over there is Mount Carmel. Ah, thank you, Jesus. And way over here in a, in a hemisphere shape, oh, my, is Mount Tabor, the, the historical place for the Mount of Transfiguration. And, and the tour guide, knowing we're Pentecostal preachers and getting us all stirred up, and those boys were slobbering and shouting and screaming, and he's talking about blood to the horse's bridles and all this stuff, and I'm there looking at two mountains. So hallelujah. Holy Ghost fell on me. Right then and there, started prophesying about Elijah being on both mountains, on Mount Carmel and at the Mount of Transfiguration. Got to prophesying and swallowed that tour guide and everything he was saying right up. Oh, and the Holy Ghost fell on all 50 of us. Tour guide came to me and said, uh, we're going to the Jordan tomorrow. You want to preach? <laughs> I said, does a cat have climbing gear? Does a bear run wild in the woods? Come on. I'm not a good swimmer, and it had been raining, and the Jordan was deep and wide and muddy. Oh, God, help me, Jesus. But I rolled my pants legs up, and I have stood in the muddy Jordan, and I have preached the word. And when I did, hallelujah, the Holy Ghost fell on us again. Whoo! I baptized 20 of those Pentecostal preachers in Jesus' name before they knew what hit them. And then they all got happy. Four of them jumped on me and baptized me. Hallelujah. I have been baptized in the Jordan River. 
so what? <laughs> <laughs> now you know that blood's going to run. It's going to run to the horse's bridle. You know that, preacher Barner. Well, let's talk about that. Okay? I'm not being sarcastic. Just, you know, I muse. I, I think. Say this with me. If I don't read, if I don't read, I can't think. And if I can't think, I have nothing to say. Very good, very good. Do you know how much blood you'd need for that thing to run 200 furlongs? My God. It was 200 furlongs, like 200 miles. I forget the exact. I'd have to go look it up. Let me, let me see. Do I have the scripture here? Don't go looking it up. Don't go to correct me. <laughs> no, I didn't write it down. Yeah, I did. Yeah, I did. It's a space of, of 1,600 furlongs. Yeah, that's 1,600 furlongs, and that's 200, miles long. that's 200 miles long. Okay? Now, let's take all the inhabitants of the earth, all 6 billion of us. You ready? Let's put them on horses. Let's slit their throats. Let's slit the horses' throats. Slap your neighbor and say, no, not enough blood. <laughs> you, you're not hearing me. There's not enough blood to run all the way down. Come on. Through the Jordan Valley, all the way down past the Dead Sea, all the way down. There. There's not enough blood. Which means whatever Armageddon is, and I have not told you, it would have to be a spiritual not a literal battle. Ouch. Can't use that for a point of reference now. Because they'll be quick to tell you, well, we don't know when the rapture is going to happen, but the battle of Armageddon is right around the corner. And meanwhile, back at the ranch, they're already making a sequel to Omega Code. They're already making a sequel to Omega Code. And Tim LaHaye and his cronies are making millions off of a fictional thing called Left Behind. And the Americans are swallowing it because the people don't know the scriptures, because the preachers won't preach the word. And God will judge the preachers for that. My, aren't we quiet? How much time we got, son, on that 90-minute take? Give me every minute you can. How much do you think we got? About 18 minutes. Sounds good to me. Let's go for 15. I'll quit at 9.30. If the tape runs out, it runs out. Come back tomorrow night. Tomorrow night, we're going to look at the history of this. Let me close. What about this temple that's going to be rebuilt? What about this Antichrist that's going to sit in it? And the scripture they use for that, of course, is 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 3 and 4. In this book, I have exegeted from the Greek text 1 Thessalonians 4 and 2 Thessalonians 2. Whole chapter. Anyway. I'm glad it's in print. Because I'm working hard tonight. I've been working hard for eight days. I love you. Does anybody understand why I'm going on about this tonight? Why? Well, so you can know the truth, but why? Why? So, not, so that you can understand you have a responsibility as Abraham's seed and David's seed, as Dr. Patterson says, to take dominion in the earth and to change your nation. That was last night's message. To occupy, come on, till he comes. You understand? I'm not going through all of this just so you'll have a proper paradigm. No. So that you will understand the issue here is not eschatology. The issue here is who you are in Jesus Christ and that you will grow up into him who is the head in all things. 
And as you grow in him, you are increasingly more responsible, and he gives you more and more authority to do the work of the Lord and to go to the nations. D does this make any sense? The issue here, please hear me. Please, I beseech you. You've got to understand it. I'm not an American, and you're not a Kiwi. We're Christians. I'm not male. This lovely young lady is not female. We're Christians. I'm not an old geezer. She's not a young beauty. We're Christians. You hear me? Told me today. Told me today that they weren't called geezers. They are, in fact, told geysers. Jerk me around. Well, I'll tell you. I'm glad what Mama told me at supper. You're not speeding Jesus. You're flying Jesus. You don't know what I'm talking about. It's the way he says he used to drive, and Mama says it wasn't that long ago. <laughs> We're Christians. Any Christians in the building? Yeah. Any overcomers? Yeah. Anybody that believes you can change your land? Yeah. Forget it. <laughs> if you believe what Schofield taught, forget it. You're just a Gentile. You're just a spiritual stepchild. You're just an afterthought in God's mind, just something in the back of his head. And his program is to rapture you out so he can renew his program of the people he really loves. And the residuals of that kind of thinking... You know what that means, you visitors? Hello? Hello, Ruth means a church that's something worth seeing. Hello, Ruth! <laughs> if you believe what's been panhandled out of America, and I don't care who's preaching it, if you believe it, you believe it because it's easy to believe. I say it is immoral. You don't have to say what I say. After tomorrow night, you'll say it. It's a doctrine of demons. It takes the blood covenant which cannot fail and says it's never happened yet. You wish, devil. Tomorrow night, I will present to you the Jesus of history and show you explicitly right out of A.D. 27, the spring of that year, Jesus Christ the tree of life hung suspended on the tree of death as God thirsting for man and as man thirsting for God. It happened historically. I can take you to the month. I can take you to the year. Daniel made sure of that. So did Gabriel. It happened. Schofield says it never happened. The fulcrum of human history is A.D. 27 to A.D. 34. What happened? Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, the first seven chapters of the book of Acts. Schofield said, it never happened. I say you are your father the devil. Now, preacher, if you can go preach that stuff without investigating it, you got more courage than I have. And you will stand before the Lord. And you will tell him why. You preached it. The Lord's in this place. A pastor of a multiracial church, my black brothers would say, he's walking heavy. I love you. This whole Schofield thing we're going to expose tomorrow night. Hear me, please, please. It was raised up with the evil one to keep you from ever understanding who you were as the seed of Abraham. There it is, and the seed of David. Because if you ever find out that the Jew is you, if you ever find out who you are, then you'll know what you have, and then you'll go after it. Now that's
That's why I'm here tonight. And I love you enough. I love you enough to tell you. The enemy is terrified at the thought of me or anybody like me coming to your nation. He's terrified, Des, at the thought of these tapes getting out. He's terrified. Because through the word of the Lord, this thing, and the right spirit which I have, it is exposing him. You understand me? I'm not against people. I'm not against denominations. I'm not even against the preachers who are foolish enough to preach this stuff without investigating it. Uh-uh. I'm out to slit the throat of the one who invented it. David killed Goliath. David's mighty men killed his kinfolk. Jesus defeated the devil. The church is to arise as salt and light and rid the earth of the influence of Satan. And you're supposed to do it in this nation. You'll die to go and go to heaven and never even know what's happening. You'll just let life happen to you for 70 years unless you get your book and take it home, study it, weep over it, pray over it, and find out who you are and what you have. I won't sleep tonight. I might as well go right. I'm too stirred up. Every time I preach this stuff, I get myself so stirred up. There's two Greek words for temple, children. Hieron and naos. Hieron means a natural building. Found in Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, 1 Corinthians 9.13 describes a building in Jerusalem. Every other reference is naos, inner sanctuary, spiritual temple. All through the Pauline epistles. What? No, you're not. Your body's a temple the Holy Ghost. Grow into a holy temple in the Lord. All through the book of Revelation, temple, naos, naos, naos. And in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 3 and 4, it's not a natural temple. It's a spiritual temple. And the apostasy there historically is the rise of Roman Catholicism, apostatizing away from the true church. And the spiritual application is just what it means. When the man of sin, which is beastly man, the old man's a beast, when he sits enthroned, <clears throat> the naos of God it says move over Jesus I don't care what Varner what any apostle or prophet evangelist pastor teacher says I don't care what the book says I know what my denomination teaches I know what they told me to teach it's my lifeline I'm in and over my head I can't change now you don't change horses in the middle of the stream yes you do it was the wrong horse and the wrong stream Now you're screaming. You better quit. Yeah, I better. I'm dangerous right now. I'm going to hurt somebody if I don't quit. I'm serious. I'm too stirred up. What about the meeting in the air? Read my lips. There'll be one. There will be one. I believe in the literal corporeal return of the Lord Jesus Christ. The Bible nowhere teaches he comes for the saints. It teaches he comes in the saints and with the saints. In the clouds and with the clouds. The key word to the meeting in the air, 1 Thessalonians 4, 13, 18, the key word is meeting. It means to welcome a dignitary. It's used in Matthew 25, verse 1, verse 6, and Acts 28, 15. Behold, the bridegroom cometh, go ye out to meeting. The Roman believers walked out 43 miles, met Paul, welcomed him, escorted him back to Rome. Nowhere does the Bible teach our disappearing. It teaches rather his appearing. Come on, somebody. It does not teach our going. It preaches his coming. Prior to 1830, his coming was personal, visible, and glorious. It still is. And you want something that will just kind of burn the whole thing up? You want another word of wisdom? When he left here, he didn't go in two stages. How about them apples? And as he goes, he comes. Not in two stages. Rapture, revelation. None of that. I'll fix that tomorrow night. I'll mop up the blood tomorrow night. I, whew, boy, I've just killed a lot of stuff up here. If you could see in the Holy Ghost, well, I'm just sloshing around in stuff up here. I've just killed so many sacred cows. I'm knee-deep in blood. <laughs> now you think I'm just being cute. If you knew my heart tonight, you'd be sitting there with tears streaming down your face. If you knew the alligators I've wrestled to the ground tonight and going into the heavens on your behalf, and I've just slugged it out with prin principalities and powers over your nation tonight, You'd pray for me. You'd thank God for me. As I've labored in the word and doctrine tonight. Why? If I can only touch one of you, that's all I need. 
if I can show one of you who you are in Christ as the seed of Abraham and seed of David. If nobody else wants it, you can be that one that will arise. I sought for a man. You can be that one that will arise and change your nation for God. There will be a meeting in the air. I love to talk about the Greek word for air. I'd like to talk about the clouds. Des has got the notes. Thank you, Jesus. The Bible nowhere teaches our going, but his coming. Well, I want to go there and get my reward. I want to go there and see Grandma. If Grandma died in Christ, he'll bring Grandma to see you. Shall not prevent those that are asleep, but those who died in Christ, those who sleep in Jesus, he will bring with him. Well, I want my reward. Well, Revelation says, Behold, I come quickly, and my reward is with me. So if you're going up and he's coming down, don't miss it. <laughs> I'm going to say one more thing, and I'm worn out, and I'm going to sit down. I'm so glad you have the notes. I'm so glad you have agreed with everything I've said. Because you're too nice for them to hurt. I love you. The truth that I proclaim tonight will not go away. It won't change. There it is. It's aimed for one thing tonight. That if you people really understand the truth about whose right it is, you will arise as a people and change your nation. If not, you believe the lie that's come to you from America. Let the world go to hell. Give me my mansion. We can't change the world. We might as well leave it. That's what America preaches. And people love it. And they buy into it. Because all you have to do is be born again. You're out here on the first load. You can reign without suffering. Cute. Dream on, baby. When Jesus came the first time, he came in the flesh and he came in the spirit. He came as a baby in Bethlehem's manger. And he stood in John 14, the upper room discourse, taught more about the Holy Ghost than anywhere else. And he said, I will not leave you comfortless or phanos. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come again to you. And in Acts chapter 2, he came. And God sent forth the spirit of his son into our hearts, whereby we cry out the Father. When he came the first time, he came in flesh, and he came in spirit. In the cycle of restoration, flip it, he comes in spirit, and he literally comes again. But when he comes in spirit this time, it will not be in the earnest of Pentecost. It will be in the fullness of tabernacles. And when he comes... <sighs> It won't be a baby cooing in a manger. And his name shall be the word of God. And his vesture shall be dipped, bopto, baptized in blood. And his name shall be the King of kings. And the Lord of lords. I can live with that. To tell you the truth, I'd give my life for that. No devil in that. Just Jesus. Now, when you give a report of this meeting, don't misrepresent me. Tell him this. Say, you know that big old boy from America? I don't think he's quite right. He's what? He's what? What word are you using? Oh, oh what? I don't know what that means. At least I say to pookie and not to puke. <laughs> I got that right. Let me tell you what I've done tonight. You want to sum it up? I'm worn out. You're worn out. We're all worn out. I feel like I slugged it out with something, Des. I really do. Because if this truth ever gets out to hungry men and women in your country, it's going to start a riot. And it's going to start among the people of God who are going to stick their fingers in the face of preachers and said, why have you lied to me? It's dangerous. It's 
That's why, Pastor Disroon, you should never read that book. You're halfway through, Jack. Don't read chapter 10. Whatever you do. I love you. You're a prophet. You got a word in your mouth and you got courage to preach it. Don't you back off. Don't you back off, sir. I deem you a prophet in this company before God. You're a prophet. And there's a word of the Lord in your mouth. And I'll give you the word they gave me 30 years ago. You will kick the bricks out of men's foundations. There's a violence about you. I like it. You're not afraid. I love it. But I love you enough to tell you. Let it run out. It's off the record. I bear in my body the marks of the Lord. So will you. I love you. I'm your servant. If I can serve you, call on me. And he's not the only man that's in this room. He's not the only woman in this room. The tape's off now. This is just pure. This is extra. This is the free part. Faith Bible College has been releasing people into their ministry for over 30 years. Established in 1969, this facility has had a profound impact on the lives of thousands of people from all over the world as they have come to learn of God's Word and be instructed in the fundamentals of Christian evangelism and teaching. Faith Bible College is situated 15 minutes from downtown Tauranga in the quiet rural setting of Welcome Bay and has plenty to offer students in their spare time. Great beaches, hot pools, waterfalls, walks, and plenty of on-the-edge activities. The grounds at Faith Bible College are spacious, yet provide a nice community atmosphere. Accommodation is in the form of single rooms, married and family units, as well as shared dwellings, which cater for two to four people. Meals prepared by our qualified chefs are held in the dining room and provide an opportunity for relaxed fellowship. The teachers at Faith Bible College are among the most respected lecturers in New Zealand. The principal, Des Short, is a renowned speaker who provides significant insight into Christian teaching. The mission of the college is to glorify God and His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, and to assist the church in fulfilling the mandate of the Great Commission, which is to preach the gospel and to make disciples of all the nations. In coming to faith, they're going to experience heart knowledge because there's nothing worse than just gaining knowledge about God and not coming to know Him personally. And what we've discovered with those that spend time with us here at Faith, they come to know the Lord in a very personal, intimate way. And then they're able to move out in the power of the Holy Spirit to manifest His character and His life wherever He leads them. There are a variety of courses available, and Faith Bible College invites applications from people who are committed to Jesus Christ and His Kingdom. Students are admitted in February and July and are drawn from many ethnic and denominational backgrounds. But they share a common goal, to communicate the gospel of Jesus Christ to today's world. I came to faith because of their involvement in missions and their focus on world evangelism. My confidence has grown a lot in the practical side of things like speaking in front of people because I've been taught how to do it. It's a very good Bible college. Uh, there's very good support, very good standard of lecturing, uh, covers a good range of subjects, and there's also a lot of support for personal growth and development as well. I found it extremely beneficial mixing with other Christians from other backgrounds. It's very quiet, it's well set out, it's a good place to be. The people here are really real, I mean, the lecturers are amazing and they're just easy to talk to and that just knowing that you've got that spiritual covering, you've got people that are praying for you and you can just go and talk to them. And I love the environment, I love Tauranga, I love the surf and the beach. And that's just a neat place to take time out and spend time seeking God. It's been a real character building experience. I needed to grow closer to the Lord. 
I felt that uh, I needed to uh, have a closer walk with the Lord and know God deeper in a deeper manner and also to know his word in a deeper sense. I have more confidence now to serve the Lord because I have been given opportunities in this college to go out and serve the Lord. Courses are registered with the New Zealand Qualifications Authority and students who require financial assistance are eligible to apply for student loans and allowances. One of the reasons for Faith Bible College's popularity is the variety of activities the students are involved in. Students normally start each day with devotions and worship, followed by lectures. Each afternoon, other activities take place, including sports, prayer meetings, hour of power, work parties and electives such as singing, drama, dance, worship leading and even car maintenance. Other attractions of Faith Bible College are that students are able to rub shoulders with other cultures and obtain practical ministry exposure both within New Zealand and overseas. As students are learning, their knowledge is put to practical use. Students become involved with various outreaches such as church ministries, prison ministries, mission organizations and secular groups. We give them practical training and then we send them out into in team situations to a wide variety of opportunities within Tauranga and beyond the Bay of Plenty. It could be as simple as taking a children's talk within a church situation. It could be as simple as working with the Cool Bananas Ministry that reach almost 2,000 kids every week here in Tauranga and learning behind the scenes skills of that ministry. It could be going to the prisons, it could be going to the rest homes, it could be going out into the community and doing practical works demonstrating love and care for other people. Some have been to places like Kazakhstan and Central Asia, Philippines, Central China, Africa, the US, other nations as well. And there's just a, 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 a growing confidence of who they are, for a start, a growing confidence of the gifts and the, and the skills that are developing. Things that they learned in the secular world, they are now seeing an application for the sake of the kingdom. And, this, and uh, there's a more, the great assurance of where they're going the opportunities after graduating from Faith Bible College are endless. Some students go on to attend other colleges. Some become attached to their home church as missionaries, while others become involved in full-time Christian work. There are over 4,000 graduates now in 56 countries. Doors open as they have made themselves available and sought God's direction. At Faith Bible College, you will be taught to be bold, upright, and full of God's power, faith, and love. Faith Bible College is giving a call. Are you prepared to answer that call?